right, well, good morning. Happy Sunday to your Real Life Church and, and Happy New Year's Eve to you as well. If we haven't gotten a chance to meet in person uh, yet, my name is Caleb Vizi and I serve as uh, the college and young adult pastor here at the church. And I just think that that's the coolest job in the world that I get to spend my time hanging out with college students and young people and get a front row seat to uh, how God is moving in their lives and in this generation and church family, let me just say, you should be excited about how God is moving in the next generation and in the young people, especially here with our church, but all across this community. And uh, I believe that God is moving in a mighty way and uh, there's hope uh, in the next generation. I firmly believe that and, and uh, just honored to, to get to hang out with them and serve them in that way. And um, today's message is what we call a standalone uh, message. It's not part of any of the message series that we do. We typically try and bring you messages in series around different topics or books of the Bible. And we just finished up our, our one that led us up to Christmas, making room, how we prepare our hearts, make room for Jesus in our life. We got to celebrate last week on Christmas Eve with you. And um, we've got some exciting message series and some things planned starting next week. I want to make sure to invite you back next week for the first Sunday in January. Man, no, no better way to start off your year than being in church with your church family. And so we'll be starting a new message series next week and got all sorts of things planned uh, that are exciting uh, for the next few months um, of our church. But today's kind of bridging the gap between the two. And um, with it being New Year's Eve, uh, I don't know if you're like me, but during this time of the year, this week between Christmas and New Year's is always a time where I, I, try, and, I try and be intentional about looking back on the year, kind of thinking back over the last 12 months and just kind of reflecting a little bit, evaluating how things went, you know, what were the good things, uh, what, were the, what were the difficult things, can I learn from them, and can I celebrate the good things, and, and then and maybe even look forward to so, uh, something else in 2024, and maybe even set some goals for the next year. All those things kind of happen during this time, and um, as you close out this year, and maybe you're doing the same thing, and maybe you're thinking back over what 2023 had in store for you. And my, my prayer and my hope is that it was a great year for you. I hope it was fantastic and, and it was full of blessings and, and all sorts of uh, God's presence. I, I hope it was great, but I have a hunch um, that if you're sitting here in this room or you're joining us online, um, that 2023 wasn't all positive for you. Um, that there maybe were some difficulties, some challenges, some, some tough circumstances that you found yourself in, that you went through, maybe it was a relational thing, maybe it was a financial thing. I, I, don't know what, I don't know what it was, but I can bet that most of us in here, including myself, went through some tough times, some difficult things over the last year. And maybe you're looking ahead to 2024, uh, hoping that you can just put those things behind you. Or maybe you're even here this morning, you're looking towards the future, worried and full of fear that it's just going to be another year where a bunch of things go wrong. It's just going to be another year full of difficult, challenging circumstances, because that's the life that I have, right? And, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe that's your outlook o- over the next year. And um, as soon as I was asked to, to, to speak on this day, I immediately knew what, what I felt like I needed to share in this moment. And that was, how do we look toward this next year? As we stand on the doorstep of one year to the next, as the calendar turns, how do we look forward to 2024 with hope for what the future holds in our lives? I got a chance to, to share a lot of what I'm going to share with you today with our college young adults at one of our Monday night services. We call them United Night back in November as we close out the semester with them. And we were actually in that series, we were focusing really on issues of, of mental health. And, and that night we were talking about depression and how to deal with that. And that, that one of the common denominators of, of, of mental health issues, and especially with depression, is this feeling that there's no hope for what's next. There's nothing for me. There's nothing out in front of me. Things are not going to get better. There's just no hope for my future. And maybe that's where you're at today. I don't don't know. Maybe 2024 looks bleak and and hopeless and meaningless. And I want to help us all as a church family step into 2024 full of hope for the future. So we kind of have a a foundational verse today to start start us off. It's Hebrews 6, verse 19. And it says this, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We have this hope as an anchor, and it's an anchor for my soul. 
Now, I, know, I know you guys know what an anchor does, but just picture it for, humor me for a moment and picture it in your mind's eye. You've got the boat up on top of the water, right? And the anchor's let down, uh, down through the water until it hits the, the bottom, the, the lake bed or the ocean floor, where, whatever it is that you're at. And it attaches itself to something that's down there that's foundational and firm, and it holds that boat in place, right? And so no matter what's happening on top of the water, if the storms come, if the winds are blowing, if rains are coming, if the waves begin to get crazy and high and crash in, uh, it, it, and instead of that boat being thrown around, that anchor helps it to stay firm. It helps it to stay secure. And what a more beautiful picture than, than what I hope for your life in 2024. Because can I just be real with you this morning, church? The storms of life are going to come in 2024. They're going to happen. And when they come, here's what I hope for you. That you, your soul, can be anchored during that storm. So that no matter what's happening, no matter what the circumstances are going around you, you can be firm and secure in your hope for the future. So let's start today by talking about how the Bible defines the word hope. What does hope mean? Especially what does it mean from a biblical perspective? Uh, in the Old Testament, there are several different words that are translated into our English word hope. But, but generally speaking, they all describe um, a tension and an expectation while we're, we're, we're anticipating and awaiting something to happen. It's this state of anticipation and expectation, right? P pretty, pretty standard. In the New Testament, the Greek word that's translated into hope is, is mostly associated with this boldness and this courage. Hope in the New Testament is always associated with Jesus and it's described as a living hope. And so all through the Bible, the word hope is based on a person. It's rooted in the idea that someone, God in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament is going to make something happen. And so we anticipate and expect it to happen. And that's what differentiates biblical hope from just simple optimism. And optimism is not bad, but it's different. And it's, it's an important distinction. You see, optimism is based on circumstances. Optimism says things are going to work out. Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. Things are going to work out. It's based on circumstances. Hope and biblical hope is based not on circumstances, but on a person. Hope doesn't say things will work out. Hope says God will work things out. And I know that's a simple but, and a subtle distinction, but it's an important one for us because this is what the Bible talks about when it talks about hope. So let me, just, let me just read it for you in this way. Biblical hope is a state of anticipation where you choose in faith to wait expectantly for God to move in your situation. Its foundation is not in what's going on around me, but in the person and the promises of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but that's a life-changing perspective for me when I can grasp hold of that. Because what it reminds me and what it teaches me is that even when the difficulties of my past or the challenges that I'm facing in my present, when those things make my future seem hopeless, it's not. Because it doesn't always look like things are going to get better, right? It doesn't always look like my circumstances and feelings don't always point towards a brighter future. They just don't. But they don't have to in order for me to find hope. It's the, it's the whole idea of hope in the storm. I can anchor myself to hope despite what's happening to me and around me because my hope is not based on anything that I'm doing, but it's based in Jesus. And so this morning as the calendar prepares to turn over from, from one month to the next, from one year to the next, uh, I, I want to I wanna look at how do we step into 2024 with hope for the future? How do I find and anchor myself to hope when my future seems unknown. And so we're going to learn from uh, the prophet Jeremiah. He's an Old Testament prophet in our Bible, um, a prophet of God. And we're going to learn from him what do we do when the, when the future seems hopeless. How do we anchor ourselves in hope? Look at what Jeremiah said about the future that God has for us in a verse that's probably very well known to many of you this morning. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. He writes... For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They're plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you what? Hope and a future. 
Jeremiah's saying, this is what God says. He, there's a future for us, and there's, he has hope and good things in store for our future. But let me give you a little bit of the background of, of when and where and, and whom Jeremiah was writing this uh, to. He was speaking these words of, uh, from God um, to the people of Israel and Judah as they were in captivity and exile in Babylon. You see, the nation of Babylon had come and, and conquered much of the nations of Israel and Judah. And as they did so, they took many of the people back to Babylon in captivity as slaves. And, and they were there. And it was to those people that Jeremiah was writing this promise from God. Hey, I know it may not look like it. I know your circumstances, you're a slave in an exile in a foreign country. I know your circumstances don't point towards hope and a, and a good future. But I want to remind you that that's what I have for you. These are the plans that I have for you. Well, shortly after this, uh, Babylon returned and completely destroyed Jerusalem, came back to Judah, besieged the city, the holy city, tore down the walls, demolished the gates, burned the city, carried the people off into exile and captivity again. And I can imagine Jeremiah sitting there going, God, you just, you just told us that you have plans for our future, that there's hope for what's in front of us. And then he had to sit there and watch the city of Jerusalem be completely destroyed in front of his eyes. This was Jerusalem. This was the holy city. This was supposed to be God's city. This was supposed to be the capital of God's kingdom here on earth. This was where the, the temple was. It was where the seat of God's presence was supposed to be, where the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be. This was supposed to be the place. And Jeremiah watched it all be destroyed right in front of his eyes. How could there be hope for Jerusalem? How could there be hope for God's people after seeing that? And this is when Jeremiah wrote another book that's in our Bible called Lamentations. Now, Lamentations may not be a book that you've maybe not spent a lot of time in, but it's literally just it's a lament. That's why it's called that. It's, it's Jeremiah expressing his sorrow and his grief over witnessing the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, being destroyed in front of his eyes. And all hope for the future of Jerusalem seemed lost. And the first couple of chapters of Lamentations are just that. It's, it's just sorrow and grief and despair and depression. But we're going to be today in, in Lamentations chapter 3, and that's where we're going to really dig in because something happens in chapter 3 of Lamentations. Something changes in Jeremiah's heart. Something sparks um, some hope in a situation that seems hopeless. Let's look at it together. You can turn your Bibles to Lamentations chapter 3. We'll start in verse 19, and we'll have this up on the screen as well. But Jeremiah starts out writing, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. I'm thinking about all the terrible things that I've witnessed and seen and experienced, and it's making me depressed. Verse 21, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have, and there's our word again, hope. Jeremiah says, I, there's something that I'm, I, I remember something in that moment of despair and depression. I call something to mind. I remember something, and that those things that I remember actually give me hope. Verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Lamentations chapter 3 was a turning point for Jeremiah. In the midst of this destruction, depression, he found something to place his hope in. He found an anchor for his soul that he could uh, attach his hope to. And so when all hope seems lost for you, when you look towards another year, when you look towards 2024 and what the future holds, and maybe it seems bleak, maybe it seems hopeless, I want to help you today and I want to offer you today an opportunity to put your hope in the same things that Jeremiah anchored his in in these verses. And so directly from this passage we just read, I'm going to give you three anchors of hope 
that Jeremiah had that I think we can have today. The first one is this. Number one, the first anchor we have is we can find hope in his love. Hope in his love. That's where Jeremiah starts. And and, and he says, this I call to mind, and that's what gives me hope. What's the first thing that he calls to mind? Verse Verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, I'm not consumed. We can find hope in his love. And, and guys, when, when, when things seem difficult, when things become too much, this is where we have to start. This is what we remember first, that the God of the universe loves me. And it's not just a kind of a generic umbrella, you know, oh yeah, he loves everybody. No, he loves me. He loves you. He, it's a personal, committed, dedicated love. And it's a great love. And when it feels like there's no hope, that's where we start. That's the first anchor we have is remembering that the God Almighty loves me with a great love. And and it keeps me from being consumed. How? Because that love never fails. Look at how Paul describes this love in in Romans chapter 8, verse 38. He says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says there's nothing in this world that can separate. His love is so great. Nothing that I've done, nothing that happens to me, nothing that anybody else does to me, nothing that I can experience in 2024, nothing that I've been to in 2023, nothing in all this world can separate me from the great love of our Heavenly Father. And I especially love this idea that His love and His mercy, His compassions, that they're new every morning. I love that. That it's not, it's not just something that He gives to us once and we have to kind of stretch it out over our lifetime, right? No. He's got something new and fresh for us each and every morning. It's something I can remind myself of every morning. Now, I don't, I don't, know, about, I don't know about you here in this room or, or joining us online today, but I'm definitely always have been and still am a morning shower person, right? I love the morning shower. There's just, it just gets me going in the morning. It refreshes me. Always, always have a morning shower. Now, now listen, before you get grossed out, I take a shower at night too, okay? Like before I go to bed because... That's just gross, y'all, okay? Like I, at the end of the day, I take my shower, I go to bed. But even so, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning, my feet hit the floor, I go straight to my shower. And it's, it's not because I need to be cleaned. Like all I did was sleep, right? It's not, it's not that I need it for that reason, but it's what refreshes me in the morning. It's what gets me going. It's what energizes me. Some people have their, their morning cup of coffee. I've got the morning shower, okay? It's just, it's, it's what gets my day started. And just think about the idea that his love for us is new. His compassions, they never fail, and they're new each and every single morning. What if, what if tomorrow, on the first day of a new year, when your eyes open, the first thing you thought about is, wow, I am loved by the creator of the universe. He loves me with a great love, and nothing that happens to me today, nothing that I find myself in today will ever take that love away from me. What if that's what our mornings were like? What if that's how we were refreshed? Talk about an anchor for your soul. That's what it can be for us. So we can find hope, first and foremost, in his love. But here's the second anchor that Jeremiah provides for us in that passage. We find hope in his love. And number two, we find hope in his nature. We find hope in his nature. It's his character and who he is. I love verse 23 says that that, that love is new every morning for great is your faithfulness. In other words, Jeremiah finds hope in that situation, not by looking forward to what God may have in store or what God may do differently in the future, but he finds hope in that moment by looking back on what God has done. And by meditating on the fact that God in his very nature is faithful. 
It's who he is. It's what he does. He loves me and he has a plan for me. And I can trust that's true because I can trust his character and his nature. He is faithful. It never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I love this scene when God came down to Moses on Mount Sinai, way back in Exodus. Remember, he had just delivered all his people out of Israel. He came and met them at Mount Sinai. He came down. He spoke to Moses. He gave him the Ten Commandments. He gave him all the law. That's where all this is happening, and Moses asked God to reveal himself to him. Tell me, God, who, tell me really who you are so that I can lead these people. And God does it. He, he reveals himself to Moses, and he speaks about himself, and he describes himself. And it's the first place in the Bible that God talks about himself to someone. Now, I think that's pretty significant. And the first opportunity God has to describe himself, look at what he says. It's in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. It says, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, there's that love, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. You see, faithful is foundational to who God is. It, it, coming through is what he does. And so we can trust him. We can trust that he has a plan. We can trust that he's good, that he's going to come through. And we can use that as an anchor to put our hope in his nature. For great is his faithfulness. Now, this time of the, the year is also uh, very, really nostalgic for me. I'm sure it is for, for everybody. As we go around the holidays and all that, I'm always thinking back and looking back, thinking about my childhood and how I grew up and just the memories and, and the traditions, all those things. And something you, you need to know about me is I was born and raised in, in, in a little rural town in Alabama. I, that's right. I'm a Southern boy at heart. I, I know it may not always sound like it, but I can get there real fast, y'all, all right? And so I'm a Southern boy at heart, and I grew up going to, going to church there, and, and and not only did I grow up going to church, but my dad was one of the pastors at the church. He, 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 he was, uh, in fact, he was the worship pastor, or as we called it, the music minister, all right? And so he, he was in charge of leading all the songs and the music as we grew up. And, and one thing we did in, 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 in my, my church growing up in rural Alabama is we sang a lot of hymns, and we sang a lot of these old songs. And so I, especially during this time of the year, I can't help but read this passage from Lamentations and not think about the old hymn that's, I mean, literally, almost word for word, exactly pulled from this passage of Scripture. You, you probably know what it is. It, it's something like this. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father, and there is no shadow of turning with thee. And thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. And as thou hast been, that forever will be. Come on, you may know it. For great is thy faithfulness, and great is thy faithfulness, and morning by morning new mercies I see, and all I have needed thy hand hath provided. For great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. You see, great is his faithfulness. It's who he is. It's his nature. And, and, and that's why it's important. It's important to have this, this catalog of, of, of the times that God has come through for me in the past. It's, it's this, you, you got to have this greatest hits of God's faithfulness ready to play all the time. When you face something difficult, you got to be able to remember his faithfulness. That's why all throughout the Old Testament, you look through from, uh, you know, uh, as soon as Exodus happened, all the way through, what are they doing over and over? They're, they're telling the people of Israel, remember how God brought you out of Egypt. Remember how he was faithful. Remember how he got you out of slavery. Remember how he set you free. They're always pointing back to a moment of God's faithfulness because he is faithful. And so if he did it before, 
He can do it again. That's why Becca and I, even though our kids are, are still very young, very small, we try and, and tell them about times that God has been faithful, that he's provided for our family, that he's come through for us and blessed us in some specific way. We want them to grow up hearing those stories of how God has come through for our family so that one day when they face something difficult, they will know that we have a God who is faithful, that he's done it before, and so we can put our faith and our hope in the fact that he can do it again. Because he's faithful. It's who he is. We remember. That's why we took communion together today. To remember what Jesus did for us. That he is faithful. You see, God's past faithfulness produces hope for the future. And so we look forward by looking backwards. Trusting that God's character will remain the same. We anchor ourselves. We find hope in his love. We find hope in his nature. And then the third one is this. Number three, we find hope in his timing. That's what Jeremiah teaches us in this passage. We find hope in his timing. Verse 24 of Lamentations 3, he said, The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. And if we're going to find hope for the future when things seem tough, we have to learn and remember this difficult truth that God's timing is not our timing. And church, this is one of the most simplest truths, but one of the most difficult ones to take hold of. And it's also, it's, it's not only one of the most difficult ones, but it's, it's, I think it's one of the most powerful ones that if we can ever grasp this, it will set us free from so much worry and anxiety. God's timing is not our timing. Isaiah 46 talks about it this way. This is God speaking in verse 9. He says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. You see, God sees a bigger picture than we do. He sees the world from a different perspective. He is outside of times, therefore he can see the beginning and the end all at once. He has a different perspective than we do, which makes his timing the perfect timing. We want him to act now. We want him to answer my prayer now. God, would you show me something now? Would you make this stop now? And he's answering but maybe not in the way that we want to. And we, we think he's saying no, or we think he's just being silent. But, but, but maybe, maybe it is that he's saying, hey, not now, because the timing's not yet right. I, I think about it like this. So my kids, they, they, they might come to me, and they'll say, Dad, can we, can we go play outside? Can we go play outside? And I'll say, no. And, and, and they're disappointed in that answer. Because all they see is the trampoline and the swing set and, and, and what they can do outside and have fun. That's all they see. And so they're disappointed in the no that they get from me. But I give them that no because I have a different perspective than them. I see something they can't see because I have the all-powerful weather app on my phone, right? And so I know that it may look good right now, but in about 10 or 15 minutes, there's a storm coming. And it's going to start raining. And there's going to be thunder and lightning. And so you know what? The answer's no, not, the timing's not right. They don't see that, but I do. And maybe that's what God is doing with us because we have to trust in his, in his timing. And so we wait for the Lord. We trust his perfect timing. And I love how the scripture here says, notice that it says that I will wait for the Lord not wait on the Lord. Because I think there's a difference in waiting for somebody and waiting on somebody. Listen, I love my wife dearly, okay? But husbands, help me out here. There's been times where I found myself waiting on my wife to get, to get ready for it to go somewhere, right? And, and look, this is coming from somebody who values time and being on time. And I have had to learn the hard way that not everybody in the land of Menyana shares that value here, okay? And, and so there's been times, there's, I didn't think that was going to get an applause, but yeah. But there's been times where I found myself waiting on my wife. And come on, waiting on somebody is frustrating. It, it, you get angry, like it's, it, it's, it, it's annoying. Like it's no fun. 
But I can also remember times. You see, Beck and I, we, we, we met while we were in college. She was here in her hometown at NMSU. I was in Alabama. And so for the first two years of our relationship, we were very long distance from each other. So the only times we got to see each other in person was when we could scrape up enough money to buy a plane ticket to come visit each other's families, right? And so I can remember a time where we had not seen each other for several months and she was coming to spend Thanksgiving with my family. And Man, I can remember the feeling of going to the airport and standing at the bottom of that escalator. And in that moment, I wasn't waiting on her. I was waiting for her. And it was, it, it was exciting. I was, I was anticipating. There was, there was an eagerness. There was an expectation. There was joy. There was hope. There were all these things as I waited for her to be here. And so the scripture tells us and encourages us, trust God's timing, put our hope in it, and learn to wait for the Lord. And so when things seem hopeless, we, we can anchor ourselves and find hope in his great love for us. We can find hope in his nature that he doesn't change. And yes, we can even find, learn to find hope in his timing as we wait for the Lord. And so as we, as we close out, that kind of leaves us with the question, okay, that's great, Caleb, but uh, hey, that's great. I wrote those three things down, but how do I activate this? Like, how do I really get this going in my life? Like when, when the calendar turns and I wake up tomorrow, how do I like take hold of this hope that, that God has for me? And we read about, remember, we read about the hope for the future that God has for us in Jeremiah 29, 11. Remember, if I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We read about that. Well, the answer to unlocking that hope is found just two verses later, again, from Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, he says the simple statement, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. In other words, when you give me everything that you have, when you make your, your, your first priority seeking after me, when you put everything in your life and focus it on, on growing closer to me, when you seek me with all of your heart, guess what? You're going to find me. That's what God's saying. And when you find me, you find hope. I, I, I don't have to know what the future holds to have hope because my hope is not in the future. My hope is given to me from God for the future. Let me say it this way. Hope is not found in my circumstances in front of me, but in my Savior who is with me in those circumstances. You see, Jesus doesn't just give me hope. He is my hope. That's why Lamentations 3.25, Jeremiah wrote it. He said, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. And so what do I do? How do I activate this hope? I seek God in 2024. I seek him and his plans and his purposes, and I seek him with all of my heart, with everything that I have, because hope is found when I seek Jesus with all my heart. And so church, here, here's my challenge to you. Here, here's, the, here's the practical part. Here's what you can do tomorrow, because I know you're probably gonna make some New Year's resolutions. You probably got some goals you wanna accomplish, and those are good things. But my challenge to you is make the first resolution, make the first goal, the primary objective in 2024 for your life is to seek God with all that you have. Prioritize your relationship with God as your top priority. Commit to growing closer to him. Commit to reading your Bible each and every day. Commit to growing in your prayer life. Commit to being in a grow group with other believers and growing together. Seek God with all that you have in 2024. See, this means seek him with your time. Seek him with your energy. Seek him and prioritize him in your resources and your finances. Seek him with your plants. Seek him with your family. Seek him with your marriage. Seek him with your business and your job. All of your heart, go after God. Go all in in 2024. And he promises there in Jeremiah 29, 13, if you will do that, if you will seek me in that way this year, if you'll seek me with all of your heart, then you're going to find me. God's not playing hide and seek. He's not playing hard to get. He says, I just need, I, I need all of your heart. I need you to surrender it all. I need you to prioritize me. And when you do that, you'll find me. And when you find God, you'll find hope for the future, for 2024. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads and Close your eyes with me this morning. I'm going to close this out just in a time of prayer and response to what, to what God is, is doing here this morning. And 
you want to eagerly step into the new year, believing that the future will be brighter, then you can anchor your hope in these truths from God's word today. That God loves you and he has a plan for your life. Let me say that again. God loves you and he has a plan for your life. And that love is a great love that will never cease and can never be separated from you. Let it refresh you new each and every morning. And his nature never changes. He's the same God. He is the God who comes through. He is faithful, and he will bring you to the other side of this. You can trust his timing, knowing that it's perfect, because he knows the full plan of your life. Psalm 139 says that all the days of your life are laid out and recorded for God before you were ever even born. He sees the beginning and the end. He knows it, and so you can trust his timing and his plan for your life. So seek him, church. Seek him. Seek his plan. Go after God in 2024. Find him and step into this new year with hope that's an anchor for your soul. Now, if you're here this morning or you're joining us online and maybe, maybe you don't, you've never known what it's like to be able to have this this kind of hope, or this kind of faith, or this kind of whatever, for this kind of outlook for the future, because you've never known what it's like to have a relationship with God. Maybe, maybe you're hearing for the first time that God loves you, and that he does have a plan for your life and for your future. And it all starts by placing your hope in Jesus. He's the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. He's the one who paid the price. That's what we remembered with communion today. He, did the, he paid the price for the sin that separates us from God so that we could be with God, so that we could have this hope, so we could have a relationship with him. And nothing in this world will give you more hope for your future. Nothing will give you more hope for 2024 than putting your faith and your trust and your belief in Jesus Christ this morning. And maybe you've never done that. I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. Or maybe you're here or you're joining us online and hey, 2023 was a rough year. Maybe you've, you, you've done that before, but maybe you feel far from God in this moment. Maybe you've turned your back on God in some ways. Maybe there's some areas of your life that you're holding back from him. Come on, the, the calendar's turning. There's no better time than now to fully surrender every part of your life to God, to place it all in his hands, to seek him with all of your heart today, to give him control of everything to find him this morning and to step into the year with new hope. If either of those of you, then I'm gonna lead you through a prayer, just a simple prayer of surrender and commitment. But here's what I'm gonna ask of you. If that's you today and you wanna say that prayer, you wanna start a new relationship with God, you wanna commit that relationship back to God for this next year, then on the count of three, I just want you to slip your hand up just so I know, hey, count me in, Caleb, and, and that prayer. Nobody else is looking around, okay? And on the count of three, just slip your hand up and say, that's me. Ready? One, two, three. Anybody in this room? That's awesome. You can, you can slip them up, slip them right back down. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? This is, this, is, this is the moment to say, God, I'm going all in with you. Now, if you raise your hand there, I'm going to lead you through a prayer. Just say this. Say this in your heart. Say it out loud. It doesn't matter. Just say it with all that you have and believe what you're saying. But say this. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm so sorry for living life my way. Please forgive me of my sin that has separated me from you. God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he died on the cross for my sin, that he took my place so that I could have a relationship with you. And today, I put my faith in you, Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross, and I believe that you rose from the dead so that I could have new life and I could have hope for my future. Say this, say, today I surrender my life to you, Jesus. I give you the controls. Would you be the Lord of my life? Heavenly Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me strength for today and hope for my future. Thank you, God, for saving me in Jesus' name.
Now, Heavenly Father, I just take a moment to thank you for the people who prayed that prayer and for the hearts that turned back to you in this moment. And God, may all of us make that commitment to go all in with you in the upcoming year. God, we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the living hope that we have, that no matter what's going on around us, we know that we are loved by you. No matter what storms of life are happening to us, we know that you are faithful and you are true. No matter what we face in our future, we know that your timing is perfect. And so we seek you with all that we have this year, God. I thank you for the promises in your word that as we draw close to you, you will draw near to us. That as we seek you with all that we have, we will find you. We thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. And we give you, Jesus, all the praise and honor and glory for it. And it's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. Church family, can we just celebrate what God's done today? Thank you.